I stand between you and coffee, and it seems like lots of us could use some coffee, so I'm going to be quite quick. Um, so first, I'd like to thank um, the World Renewable Energy Technology Conference for inviting me here. Um, I work at the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water. We're a New Delhi-based international think tank, and our work is predominantly focused on energy, environment, and water, but in a more nuanced way on supporting policymakers to try and understand the use, misuse, and reuse of resources and support decision-making. Um, particularly in the context of today's discussion, uh, the speakers before me have all spoken eloquently about all that we've got right. Right? We've got great targets, we've got policy that works, and, and so everything should be great. We've got $40 billion in the last four years, and so really, why are we having this session at all? And, and to my mind, I think the answer in that is because $40 billion is a far cry from what we really need. It's also far short of what is being spent on renewables all, all over the world. So just in the year gone by, the world saw $333 billion of investment in renewable energy, including large hydro, which is not something that we consider renewables in India. But regardless, $10 billion of that was spent in India. So even if that means that 10 billion is covering all the good bankable projects that have good promoters and that, that are solid projects, that then means that we have another problem, which is that we don't have a strong enough pipeline of projects. So while I don't disagree at all with anything that, that um, speakers before me have said, um, I, I'd like to sort of add a little bit of nuance to something that Manav said around just as it's a new sector, you need new kind of investment decision makers as well. Except when you do that, when you need the investment decision to be based in a great amount of detailed understanding of not just the sector but also of the project, what that does is it creates a very large cost of not just doing due diligence but also engaging with each project before you invest in this. That's all quite all right when you're making an equity decision, not so much when you're making a debt decision that will turn very quickly. So how do you mobilize financial investments for renewable energy projects, which is what this session is called, but more importantly, how do you do that at scale, and how do you do that from sources other than the sources that we are using today? So if we were to talk about the debt market, in India we have an over-reliance on bank debt. How do we move away from that? How do we mobilize debt from other sources? So then we hear a lot about green bonds. And green bonds are, are often talked about as the silver bullet, so to speak, for this sector, right? Not so much, because the, the problems that are plaguing the, the conventional um, debt sectors, for instance, banks, are also going to be the problems that will, that will plague the, the bond market, right? And then there are, of course, problems unique to the market itself. So what is it really, what are these problems, right? And, and so, so all the financial experts on the panel also, they all spoke of risks. So there are real risks, and then there are perceived risks. And for any new sector, there is a big problem of risk perception, and there's a delta between real risk and the perceived risk. And the reason for that, in my mind, um, is that we have an information asymmetry in the sector, which is why there is this very high cost of due diligence, which is why we believe that there, isn't, there aren't enough bankable projects in the pipeline, because we feel like there is, there, the, the risk is very high for a lot of these projects. But perhaps that's because we haven't engaged enough with, with the sector, right? which is what Mano was saying. So, what is the way to bridge this gap, really, between my understanding of risk and your understanding of risk? So really, how do you get all the stakeholders in the sector to have more or less a common understanding of where is the risk profile really at of an average renewable energy project? By building evidence. That, as a researcher, my answer will always be build evidence, right? In the renewable energy sector, there is a big paucity of data. We do not build evidence. All decisions, whether it is the decisions that are being made by policymakers, or they are the decisions that are being made by developers, or the decisions that are being made by finan financiers, whether debt or equity, are based on anecdotal evidence. That, in I mean, I think we can all agree that's quite problematic. We are no longer we are a young renewable energy market, but we are not a small renewable energy market, and we do not intend to be 
to either stay young or small. Right? We want the, the targets, as we have heard, are, are large, the, the pathways are long, and, and even if the targets end in 2022 or 2030, hopefully that's not where our journey ends. So why do we not monitor what is working and what is not working better? One instance where there has been data that has been created is in the reverse auction process. It's a function of a transparent reverse auction that there is data. And that has worked really well for us. We've been able to do a lot of price discovery. And then we have, because we've had the evidence, we've been able to replicate that in the wind sector as well. Take it from solar to wind. There were people who were displeased because as a function of information asymmetry, there are people who win more than there are people I mean, who win as a function of the asymmetry, right? But as a result of that, now we are able to develop wind at the same sort of growth rate, but at much lower prices. So really, I think that it's very important to understand why the market is developing the way it's developing, not just to identify what is happening, but more to understand why in order to mobilize finance at scale. Once we understand these risks, which um, the, um, Mr. Gupta also spoke about in, in his presentation, it's important to then think about how do we address these risks. So first we all understand we have a common vocabulary and understanding of the quantum of risk. Then we say, what do we do about it? And that's where it becomes really interesting and I think that's where we need to be innovative. The sector is new and innovative and it needs to be met with innovative responses as well. And I, that is where the role of policy becomes more important. Not just in target setting, but in breaking down those target into the intermediate steps that need to be walked, as well as that don't need to be walked. So what will work today will not work. What has gotten us so far will not get us further. And what we need for the next five years, we do, will no longer need after that. So we need to build in sunset clauses into our policy recommendations. Very, very uh, important from my point of view. So then what do we do to address these risks? And that's where there is the, the value proposition of what do you do with public money? Not necessarily just Indian public money, but also global public money. There is a lot of money that has been earmarked to be catalytic in its very nature. When that money is used to do vanilla project financing, it violates the very principle for which that, that pot of money was set up. And that is where some of the ideas um, that, that Mr. Gupta had around de-risking mechanisms, but more systemic de-risking mechanisms where you identify the problem very specifically say the systemic solution may be technological, may be regulatory, may be financial, but in the interim, this is what I can do with public money to take the market forward almost like a nudge variable. If we try and understand where is the data, what does the data say, what does that mean, and how can I address it, those are the four steps in my mind to unlocking finance at scale from existing sources at lower prices as well as from new sources that are currently untapped for a growing market in India. And so I'll stop there and, and hand it back to Mr.